Hello, this is Mr. Smith again, um, and welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at Greece again, um, but kind of from a different vantage point. Today, I really wanted to focus in on Athens specifically. Um, and I know that we spent some time sort of looking at Athens today, but, you know, I, I, there's just so many things that um, we, we should be talking about that there's some big picture stuff. One uh, one thing I wanted to just note here really quickly was Athens' proximity to the sea. So the city of Athens is here. The sea is right here. And this is um, there's a port right here, which the Athenians back in 400 BCE called Piraeus. And if we zoom in here, it might even pop up. Yeah, there it is right there. This port was actually a really important part of um, the Athenian Empire. It's where the entire navy sort of... Um, you know, it's it's where all of Athenian power radiated from was from that port, and um, you know during the wars there were there were routes built between the city of Athens and Piraeus um, in such a way as to ensure that um, that you could always get to uh, Piraeus. The other thing I thought would be kind of cool go would be to go to the Diplon Gate. This was the old entry to the city. Um, and if we take a look at it here, um, you'll note the city itself would have been a lot smaller, um, like a lot smaller at the time that, uh, is, is, I mean, this is a huge city today, um, but it would have been a lot smaller and the Diplon Gate would have been the primary entry into the city. And um, we, if you were to take the Diplon Gate today, it's kind of hard to sort of tell but you would have made your way basically from here um, and uh, you would have made your way uh, through a series of walkways that would have ultimately brought you into the Agora. And this is the Agora here. And um, I know it's kind of hard to tell, but you've got over here, you've got the Temple of Hephaestus. Um, this is a, which was actually a classical building. Um, this here, the Stoa of Adalus, which was built actually in the Hellenistic period. Um, but the Agora is a really important thing to talk about. The Agora was the center of Athenian life. The Agora was actually the center of most city-states' lives. And um, it's sort of interesting if you look at the 250, uh, 250 pieces that were required to learn in uh, art history, um, you know, 249 of them are works of art. And then there's the Agora, which is literally just like the old city center of Athens. And it's not really a work of art. I mean, there might have been buildings here that were in their own right works of art, but like they, they're they not here anymore. And we're not even really sure what they look like. But what we do know was that there was a boule, and it was probably this rounded building right here. And that boule was probably the place where representatives of the Greek democracy met. Um, we know that, um, like the Stove of Attalus today, there would have been long colonnades um, that would have created protected areas for people to set up shops. So this was the political center of Athens. It was the economic heart of Athens. And actually, for a long time, it was one of the religious centers. So Athens named Athens because it was named after Athena. Um, this area of um, Athens actually used to have a lot of temples that were not dedicated to Athena. So once again, for example, um, as you can see here, uh, the temple of Hephaestus. And the temple of Hephaestus here is actually in the Doric order. We'll talk about the Doric order later. So this whole area was, would have been really sort of key. And one of the things you can see, you can see this road that kind of goes along right here. That's actually part of what is called the pan Athenaic way. Pan meaning all, Athenaic meaning like all Athens way. This was the primary road. And it was the primary road that went through the heart of the city. It went from the Diplon Gate, which in many cases was sort of like the entry into the heart of the city. Um, through the Agora. And then as you can see, it wound its way up this most famous area right here, wound its way up to um, about right about here, which is where we see um, uh, the, sorry, on, on this side, it's kind of hard to, I'm wondering if I can spin it around there. We go. So um, it came, wrapped its way around here, and worked its way up through to this building right here. And this building right here um, 
is called the Propylia, which in Greek literally means gate. Um, and it was a gateway. You know, it's really interesting because the building itself means gate, but it's built in a, in a typical Greek style, which we'll analyze later. Um, but it was never really meant to be a temple so much as it was sort of like a gate that in some sense marks the beginning of a spiritual um, place. You know, the, it's, it, it, for all intents and purposes, this building right here act as, acted as the gateway into the, uh, the, the entry of, of the sort of spiritual realm, um, so to speak. And in that spiritual realm are all of these buildings of um, the Acropolis, right? And of course, you know, you've got the Parthenon, which is this very large one right here. Um, but then you've also got the Erechtheon, which um, after the Persians burnt the city to the ground, we think that the reason why this building has sort of irregular features, you'll notice that there's a porch sticking off this side. That porch is called the Caryatid porch. And then there's this main structure here. And by the way, it doesn't look like this. It's, it's just very weirdly, you know. Uh, modeled in this three-dimensional system and then you've got this other porch that's built in what is called the ionic style sticking off the other side so what we think actually probably happened here was that there were several temples that had been built on the acropolis before the invasion of the persians when the persians came in and burnt everything to the ground um, they probably rebuilt the erechtheon in this sort of three-part um, type in order to make up for several buildings that were um that were leveled by the Persians. Um, we also know that there would have been other buildings up here. We also believe that in the center, somewhere probably around here or here, there would have been a wooden statue of Athena made of olive wood. Olive, of course, was the gift that Athena gave to the Athenians in the mythological story of Poseidon and Athena, where you have this interesting story where the two deities, um, Poseidon and Athena, were each vying for patronage of Athens and um, Poseidon gave the Athenians a saltwater spring, and Athena gave them the olive tree, which, of course, they made olive oil from. Um, the last building that I wanted to just point out here is this little tiny guy right here. This is called the Temple of Athena Nike, Nike meaning victory. So to kind of like wrap all this up, this Pan-Athenaic way connects all of the major components of the city. It winds down from the Acropolis um, and then cuts back sharply uh, towards this open area here. Um, let's see if we can get in here into this open area here and makes its way down here through um, what is the heart of the city, the um, Agora, the city center. Again, the political center, the economic center, and even in the archaic period, to a lesser extent, a spiritual center because there were temples here. And it would have made its way through the Diplon Gate. Now, just outside of the Diplon Gate, and I think um, one of our classmates um, actually noted this, just outside uh, on one of these sites is actually the Karamikos. And for those of you guys that remember, the Karamikos was that. Um, see if I can accurately place this. Um, it was the cemetery where many of the things that we're going to be looking at um, were. So it's zooming us around. Okay, so basically what we're looking at here is that the Karamikos, where the neighborhood is now called the Karamikos, probably because it was built smack dab on top of where the cemetery of, um, you know, the ancient Athenians was. And so what's left of it is probably just this area probably just this area here. Um, but again, from there, if we zoom back out, you're going to enter past the Diplon Gate as you work this way here. So again, the cemetery just outside the Dipl Diplon Gate. So all of these major places very much connected. I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of some of the pieces that you guys need to know um, in the context of the geography of the city. So of course, you need to know the Acropolis itself, which is this entire sacred hill in the middle of the city. You're going to need to know the Parthenon and the builders of the Parthenon, um, Ictinus and Callicrates. You're going to need to know the um, Erechtheon, which is this building here, named after the uh, mythological king Erechtheus and built by um, uh, an architect whose name happens to escape me at the time. It'll come, come to me in a moment. Um, and the Propylia here, which is the entryway gate, and then the Temple of Athena Nike right here. Um, also on the Acropolis would have been in the archaic period, 
that wonderful little sculpture, that archaic sculpture of the female Kore, right? Um, as we wind our way down here, we go into the Agora. The Agora is actually one of our pieces, so we actually do have to know it. Um, and again, it's got the Stoa of Attalus, which is this modern reconstruction right here. The um, Temple of Hephaestus, which is down here, as well as several other buildings that would have been for economic and political purposes. Um, and then as we cross the street where the roads would have been originally, we go through the Diplon Gate and into the Karamaikos. And in the Karamaikos, we would have found things like the um, the Koros figure, the Anna Viosos Koros, uh, which is actually this figure right here. And we also would have found the Grave Steel of, of Hegeso, which we'll be looking at a little bit later on. Now, um, <clears throat> we noted when we were here last that um, there was this sort of like interesting um, thing where Greek sculpture was changing a lot and it was changing really fast. But to my eye, when I look at something like this, where I'm looking at this classical piece from 480 um, BCE on this side, and I'm looking at this archaic piece from around 500 BCE on this side, I'm seeing something that is, you know, definitely clearly archaic. And we know that it's archaic, you know, because it's got the archaic smile. And here, by contrast, I'm looking at something that's definitely classical. And I know that it's classical mainly because of the contrapposto pose that it's in. So there's a few dead giveaways. But to my eye, there's something far more simpler. If I look at this sculpture right here, this sculpture here seems to have much more in common with an Egyptian sculpture. The hands stiffly laid at the sides, the feet in a single step forward, um, the frontality of the pose right, where the chest and the legs and everything are very frontal. The classical statue over here, by contrast, isn't afraid to have that sense of movement where one leg moves out, perhaps this arm moves back a little bit, and this one moves forward as the chest seems to slightly twist, and then the neck just very subtly, subtly turns as he sort of looks off into the distance. So almost sort of like coming to life, right? And that liveliness, that sense of life that we find in here is something that I think um, sculptors really strived for in this in this period um, of the classical age and i think that um it, it coincides with this this golden age of greek democracy where you saw in almost every other major discipline uh besides the arts whether it was philosophy or mathematics or whatever you saw these sort of major breakthroughs and I, to me this sort of shift here this 20-year shift from 500 to 480 demonstrates a major breakthrough and that breakthrough would only become more sophisticated as we move to Polyclitus's canon. Now, um, people call this statue the Dory Forest, and that's that's fine. Dory Forest means spear bearer, and Dory Forest, the spear bearer, could mean um, two things. One, it could be that he's holding a spear here, and therefore um, he might be throwing that spear in an athletic competition, which reminds us that the Greeks were, you know, the inventors of the Olympics, right? Um, so he might be uh, engaging in something like that, but he he might also be, because the spear was the basic weapon of the hoplites, he might also be basically practicing for warfare. And in fact, the Olympics may have actually been that, that, you know, like training athletes for the Olympics may have been very similar to the training that they did in, in order to prepare for war. But either way, therefore, we can say that Polyclitus is canon here. Um, and I like to call it the canon because in, in some sense, this sculpture, he wrote the ideas before he created the sculpture, and then the sculpture was ultimately the product of the ideas, right? And the ideas uh, that he wrote down in his canon of proportions were a set of rules about ratios, as we discussed last time. And then, therefore, the the uh, sculpture would just be the um, the physical manifestation of the ideas, right? Of his ideas. And to me, that is endlessly fascinating. Um, but there's something deeply missing here, and that we talked about this last time, and that thing that is missing is when you walk around this, and by the way, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but this photograph is actually taken in Pompeii, and we're going to talk a lot about Pompeii this year. Pompeii is a Roman city that was covered in ashes, and in fact, when they uncovered Pompeii, they found Roman copies, Roman copies of Polyclitus and Dory Forest. And it's not the only Roman copy they found. They found them everywhere. In fact, as you look at these copies, you'll notice that not all of them are the same. Some of them are different. Um, in fact, you can see the sort of tree trunk here versus this one here. These are clearly different statues, right? 
But one of the things that pop comes to my mind is the realization that every time you see one of these sort of things stuck to the back and and it's in marble, right? It's going to tell you it's a Roman copy because the original the original work by uh, Polyclitus would have been in bronze. Well, what does bronze look like? What does that look like for a Greek sculptor in bronze? Now, when the Christians came in and converted a lot of these areas, they melted a lot of the bronze sculptures down. Um, so very few Greek bronzes ex exist. Um, in the early classical age, they were still using marble. So we're lucky in that sense. But I mean, even if you compare, you know, the Critios boy to Polyclitus' canning, even this Roman copy, you know, it's really interesting to sort of see see those things and the heightened naturalism that the sculptor here was aiming for. And it begs the question, you know, was the original sculpture by Polyclitus, did it also have hollow eyes? Was Were there other metals that were used to make it look more realistic? To answer those questions, we have to actually look at other bronze sculptures um, by, made by the Greeks. Now, I just told you that most of them melted down. Well, turns out we're in luck because Greek sculptors were so sought after that um, that people actually purchased sculptures from the Greeks like all over the world. And so ships um, took these sculptures, put them on their ships, and then and then brought them to these places. They are also stolen from places as spoils of war because they were considered so beautiful. And every once in a while, those ships would go down in a storm. And so for our purposes, when those ships were discovered or when those things, uh, every once in a while, they would discover these um, sculptures at the bottom of the sea. And that's exactly what this Riachi warrior is. This Riachi warrior was, sat, was found um, I want to say it was in the 1970s, and he actually has a twin brother. We don't know that they're actually twins, but there were two bronze sculptures that were sound, found pretty much side by side um, in the remains of a sunken ship. And um, one of the things that we note is that this is approximately around the time of 450. When people found this, they immediately said, oh my gosh, this must be by Polyclitus because it looks, it just looks so much like the the dory forest right but this is the, this is the bronze that he would have used well there's no way that we could have actually know that this is polyclitus's work but what we do know is that his canon of proportions was so darn stinking influential that even if this wasn't polyclitus and more importantly if this was another sculptor that other sculptors copied his canon they utilized his ratios in order to create these things what this also tells us is that unlike the romans the greeks had no need for any kind of post sitting behind here, uh, like this right here, to hold up the statue. The Greeks had figured out a way to make these things literally stand on their own two feet, which is really quite impressive. Um, we also know that this guy probably would have been um, a hoplite warrior. He would have had a shield in this hand. And in this, he probably would have held his six or seven foot spear. Um, we we actually found helmets here, and the and his brother statue actually has a helmet, so he may have actually had a helmet. And you'll notice that there's like this band around the hair, which, uh, going back to the Critios boy, there's also a band around his hair that may have actually been to place an actual like real helmet on top of his head, uh, once again to heighten the realism. Um, speaking of heightening the realism, there are all of these little things here, like the lips actually have copper on them, so that the lips. Um, look like they they have that sort of reddish tone to it. Um, the eyes have inlays in them and probably would have originally had some kind of um, black obsidian for a pupil. So the pupil is actually inset here. The um, hair is curly. The Like everything about this is just off the charts. And in its original form, when this was polished up, it would have been gleaming, absolutely gleaming bronze. And so this really would have been... Um, you know, imagine like someone who, and, and the Greeks literally did this. I, I, I This is going to sound kind of weird, but the Greeks literally would exercise, the men in particular, would exercise outside, typically in the nude. In fact, um, the Olympic events, many of the Olympic events actually took place in the nude. So like when they were competing with other Greeks, um, they, they, they oftentimes um, took place in the nude. There's a famous sculptor, or sculpture, I should say, called the Scraper. And um, you know, just like us today, uh, the Greeks were probably kind of obsessed with beauty and physical components and the physical body and the, and the beauty of the physical body. So one of the things that they would do to augment the physical beauty of the body is they would actually cover themselves, uh, get this, in olive oil so that when they went out into the sun, they would be sort of glistening, right? 
Um, and they would exercise like that and they would, um, compete in the Olympics like that. And, um, uh, so there's this famous statue called the scraper where the guy is actually using a sharp piece of obsidian and he's scraping off, um, the olive oil after a competition. You can imagine if you were like doing a running race, right. Um, or some other kind of uh, athletic competition and you're like the dust like attaches to the olive oil and you sort of get this thick layer of scum all over that it would literally take some kind of scraping to sort of get that off. Um, we also find uh, as we move through the classical period that even the simplicity of the the class of the the contrapposto pose would be challenged as artists sought to create more complex poses. This right here is also another one of these statues that may have been lost at sea. Uh, I think I believe it was lost at sea. Um, and we think, you know, on the one hand, some people have hypothesized that this could do could also be, you know, a spear thrower, but it may actually be it may actually be Zeus um, or Poseidon. If it is Zeus, he's throwing a lightning lightning bolt. If it's Poseidon, he's throwing a trident. Um, and um, he the statue is actually larger than life size. These statues are about life size, slightly larger. Um, and so even the simple, even the pose of contrapasso continues to be challenged as as Greeks continue to look for increasingly new ways to sort of like um, um, compete with one another to create the greatest. Uh, sculpture, so that humanist culture continually driving change, right? Um, one other thing I just wanted to note before this, because I find this absolutely fascinating. You'll note the base that this sculpture is actually standing on. Um, there, there was a team of um, um, art historians and archaeologists who, when these were recovered, they sort of asked the question, how would the Greeks have stood these up? And the answer to that is that it would probably would have been standing on some kind of sand. So what the um, so what the uh, the the uh, designers of this base did is they said, okay, well we want sand, but we also have earthquakes because this is currently in Italy, even though it was made in Greece, it's currently held in Italy, and so they put a small amount of ground rubber in with sand and created this these boxes, right? And so you can kind of see the box around here, and then the ground sand with um, small pieces of rubber, and so this thing stands basically on its own. Um, for the most part. And when, uh, even like when there's an earthquake, it can stand like on its own. It's really quite uh, uh, ex extraordinary. Um, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about how you make a bronze statue. They use a technique in ancient Greece called the lost wax casting method. Um, in Hemet, California, the lost wax casting method. In Hemet, California, there is an artist who's actually um, pretty much world famous. He's famous throughout the United States at the very least. He lives in Hemet, California, which is where you live. And his wife is my former third grade teacher. His name is Max DeMoss. And you can look him up if you want. Um, but Max DeMoss um, actually has uh, what is essentially a forge and a sculpture studio in Vala Vista, California, which is over by where my parents live, near the orange groves. And he actually still utilizes the lost wax casting method. And I actually talked to him about a year and a half ago, um, and we had come up with a plan for him to come in and, and talk to my art history students about this stuff. Um, but then, of course, you know, the pandemic and all these other things hit. And so you can go and watch his videos. I think he has some videos. I think he has a website. I don't remember correctly. I've, I've only spoken in person. I haven't actually looked for him online. But he still utilizes this very same method that the ancient Greeks used. Um, and I want to walk you through it because it pops up on at the AP test every once in a while. Um, and it's an important sort of idea to sort of understand how they got these sculptures. Because it, inside of the bronze, it's actually hollow. Um, to make it solid would have been so incredibly expensive. Um, it really almost wouldn't have been feasible. So you'll note that you start here with something like we, what we call an armature. Um, could be wood. And you would basically uh, put it together, assemble it together in a way that, that approximates the, um, the, the, the form that you're looking for. So in this case, you've got a slight bend in the knee, a slight bend in the arm to approximate you know, how you're going to sculpt this. And then you would add clay 
um, which is not a whole lot different than, you know, like terracotta or things like that, the lumps of clay that you use in Mr. Hamleister's class or anything like that in ceramics. And you sort of put it all over the armature um, and you um, and you use the wood basically as support so that the clay doesn't fall over, right? And then after you've basically carved this thing in clay and you get it as close to possible, as, as close as possible, you want to really get this to like, the um the look that you want and then after that you're going to uh, melt and apply as it dries a thin wax coating so you've got the clay and then then you've got this thin wax coating and keep that wax coating met in mind because the wax is the you know the key component here in lost wax casting right because it's the wax that is going to be melted out to make room for the bronze later on. And so that's a key sort of thing to note. So they're gonna make the they're gonna put the wax in and then they're gonna make the wax look as realistic as possible, as much with the final details as possible. And then after you've got these incredibly realistic details in the wax, you put another clay mold over that. You'll notice as you put the other clay mold over it that you're also putting a few little pins here. And those pins, you're going to basically connect from the wax through um, this layer of clay. And in general, that's very simply to make sure that if you heat or when you heat this up, that the, the cl that the wax inside of here actually has a place to leak out. So if you've done all of these things, you have a layer of clay, a layer of wax, and another layer of clay. And at that point, if you heat it up, then the clay will melt and leak out of these pin areas, right? And sometimes they would actually connect series of really complex tubes and things like that um, into sort of drainage ports. And they would build like a whole wooden box frame, which is kind of like what you have here. They would build this whole wooden box frame and then they would, you know, do various things. Either they'd heat it up. Some, some people even speculate that they would have just poured the bronze in, and as you poured the bronze in, it would have melted the wax because the max the wax is um, is prone to melting because it's just wax, right? And so the wax would sort of leak out this way. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's true because you would have had to have closed the pins um, in order to prevent the um, the uh, uh, bronze from melt from from leaking out, right? So, but the idea being you, you get all of the wax out and then you pour the bronze in and the bronze basically fills that thin cavity where the wax used to be. And so you're actually using very little bronze but because bronze is a fairly strong material. You end up getting that. Then you break out the mold. Um, sometimes that means that you're going to be left with um, a clay and wood uh, armature inside of this. Um, some people have hypothesized that they might have done things like putting holes in the feet or things like that to try and get out some of that material to, to ensure that it has balance. But that's basically the idea of how you would cast this. And to be very, very, very clear, because this is important, um, polyclitus's canon of proportions, right? Polyclitus is a so-called Dory Forest, was made in bronze, and polyclitus made sculptures in bronze. It became the most famous statue, so famous that everybody copied it, which is why we have all these Roman copies. And then later on, uh, people melted down the bronze, probably because it was a nude statue in a, in a place where people were converting to Islam and Christianity and things like that. Um, so FYI. But one of the last statues we're going to look at in this particular section is the late classical statue. Here, this is a this is a headstone, and this looks more like the kind of tomb marker that we are familiar with, right? Unlike, you know, for example, the um, the giant vase that marked the tomb, or these um, Anaviosos Koros, which marks the tombs, right? This sort of thing looks, you know, understandable to us, and in fact, it's got a carving. Um, here in, in uh, ancient Greece that actually says the name Hegeso, uh, daughter of, um, it'll, it'll come to me, um, daughter of Proximus, Proxen, Proxeno, I think it is what it is. Um, and actually Hegeso, daughter of Proxeno is actually really kind of like an important component of this because what it's doing is it's saying that you've got um, Hegeso that is, that is the current citizen of Athens and then her mother, I think it was her mother, Proxeno, and I think it's Proxeno. I could be spelling it wrong. Um, you have to look it up. Uh, 
as like two generations of Athenians. And I say that because at the time, uh, the, the Peloponnesian War had begun. And during the Peloponnesian War, the uh, Greeks were fighting other Greeks. The Greeks were fighting, the, the Athenians in this case were fighting the army of the Spartans. And that was because the Athenians had grown so powerful and they built such a large empire. They'd actually begun essentially taking over other Greek city-states. Um, so for those of you guys who, who are interested, there's this phenomenal um, work called the Melian Dialogue. You'll probably read it in, in college. And the Melian Dialogue is basically an explanation it's it's the <laughs> it's so interesting. It's the Athenians basically explain explaining to the islanders of Melos why Athens, even though Athens is a democracy, should be able to control other Greek city states. And it's this classic sort of like dialogue that basically says, "Hey, you know, we're the ones with the power. We're the ones with the might, the military. That's why we govern you." Um, so if you're interested in pieces of history like that, it's kind of interesting. And a lot of people sort of look at the Melian dialogue and they sort of realize, okay, this is the point at which the Athenians have truly become corrupt with power. Uh, it's no wonder that other Greek city states allied together to sort of stop them from becoming, um, even stronger. And of course, Sparta played a really important role in those so-called Peloponnesian wars that would lead to, um, you know what, I think it's one P and two N's. The Peloponnesian Wars, these are so hard to spell sometimes, um, which would eventually lead to the downfall of the Athenians against the Spartans. And this um, this piece comes to us in that context. And, and so understanding what was going on in the Peloponnesian Wars is kind of crucial to understanding this piece, because what's going on is that the, um, the Athenians are trying to increase the size of their navy. Well, um, how do you get people to row a trireme and a trireme is, is you guys can look up the word trireme. A trireme is basically a massive ship with like a bronze tipped battering ram um, and, and a, an upper deck and a lower deck. And on the lower deck, you would have had a whole bunch of people in really good shape rowing this ship. And then on the upper deck, you would have had some so-called Marines, which would have been like armed soldiers in case you broadsided another ship and people crossed over the decks to kill each other. But in general, the idea was, you know, uh, to when you're sailing, you know, your ship uh, or one ship is this way. The idea is actually to get your ship headed straight at it this way so that you could use your battering ram to sort of crash into the other one. Um, and the rams had these components. Um, i trying to think where to draw this. Uh, the rams had these components that went down under the water and then up on top of the water as well. And that portion, so you can imagine like the ship going back like this. But then it had this ram that was under the water. Um, and that ram, there was another one on top. This one on top would be to connect the two ships, if necessary, to um, attack over the, the side. And this one would be to poke a hole under the, the level of the water so that it would take on water. So you need a lot of people rowing the ship to get it going to speed in order for it to crash through a reinforced oak wood siding of, of a ship, right? Um, in order to sink these things. And so as they're, so what they needed was to increase the size of the Navy, which meant that they needed more men. So what they did, what the Athenians did is they changed their citizenship laws, right? Which basically said that anybody could come to the city of Athens. And if you enlisted, if you enlisted in the Navy, right, then you would gain citizenship. And this, you know, if you're living in a democratic system, this sort of massive increase in allowed or legal immigration sort of changed voting structures and power structures in Athens. And so a lot of old families in Athens who were, um, you know, who didn't like these changes necessarily, who felt like they were, um, you know, watering down the so-called like quality of the Athenian families because there were a lot of really what you might call like old families, kind of like old money uh, in the United States, like the Rockefellers and, and whatnot. And a lot of these Athenians absolutely saw themselves like that. They saw themselves as these sort of rich and powerful dynastic families that had been handing down power throughout generations. And so a headstone like this was absolutely designed to basically say, I'm an old family. I, Hegeso, am the daughter of Proxeno, who is here before me. And even more importantly, the person who, who uh, paid for this headstone was actually, and we know this to be true, was actually the sons of Hegeso. And so her sons, 
would have been the ones voting and the ones having political power. And so the sons were actually utilizing the headstone in a way of making a political statement about their their lineage um, and their sort of rightful uh, Athenian citizenship dating back several generations, as opposed to all of these recent immigrants who um, they would actually change the laws again to try and stop them from voting later on. Um, and so, you know, all of this sort of internal politics and internal turmoil inside of Athens suggests that the Peloponnesian War was absolutely having a negative impact on, you know, what it meant to be Athenian in the first place. Um, but it's an interesting and it's a sort of fascinating background to the nature of like how this democracy kind of changed in the midst of all of these wars and also the sort of corruption that comes along with building an empire. But anyway, um, in the piece, there's a few things that are worth noting. Number one, the gesso here is significantly larger than her servant who's over here. She's not a, she's not taller, but she's like older. That might be to suggest that she's an older woman and that the servant is a younger woman. But the servant, either way, is bringing her a box. And it was probably a box of jewelry. And you'll notice that she's pulling something out. She seems to be holding something between her fingertips. We think that this originally would have been painted and that, that might have been some kind of jewelry. And so she's like, um, you know, doing the very thing that many of us might think is like not what you want to do on your headstone, which is admire, admiring your wealth, right? Like when we think of like the admiration of wealth, we tend to think of it as like a sin, right? Especially in a Christian context. And what this clearly demonstrates for us is that the Greeks didn't live in a Christian context. In fact, it was really quite the opposite, especially for a woman living in Athens. And it, and it, begs, it begs bringing up sort of like some, some root words and some concepts. When the Athenians um, uh, in the, at this time in the classical period, um, their home, their home, their house, their house was called an oikos. And the word oikos is actually what gives us the concept of the term. This literally comes from the Greeks. Oikos namikos. Namikos. And you can ask Miss Welshon if she knows what oikos namikos means, um, it means to manage the house. It means literally to manage the house. And it's literally what gave us the term economics. And the concept of economics is absolutely about managing the house. In this case, the house is like, if we're talking about, uh, you know, U.S. economics, right? Managing the the, the, the money and the, the flows of, of money going in and out inside of the United States. Um, and that was a woman's place. That was a woman's job um, in ancient Greece was to manage the, the house, right? And to manage the money in the house. A man's role was outside in politics and war. The woman's role was inside spiritual guidance, things like that, as well as managing the house. So in that case, right, if a woman's role is to manage the family economically, then to be able to admire your wealth is to basically make a claim that your role as a woman to manage the house was done successfully. And in death, you're kind of celebrating the fact that you did the very thing that was expected of you, right? And so this was a very flattering portrait in the context of the Athenians, which makes it really, really uh, cool and really, really interesting. Um, the other thing that I really like about this is that you have these, tech these sculptural techniques that are really fascinating. The sculptural techniques are really interesting in that they sort of like, they run the gamut of a high relief to low relief. In some sections, we get fairly high relief. In fact, um, the servant of um, the servant of Hegeso, her chin actually casts a shadow on the pentelic marble. The pentelic marble is the type of marble that it's made of. So it's carved so deeply that it actually casts a shadow. But in other sections, there's a veil over here that that runs past the head of Hegeso that is just barely scratched at in what in this technique we, we call schiacciato which is where you sort of scratch at the marble to create the, the sense that there's something in the background, right? And, and it's very subtly hinted at here. Um, and so there's this sense that they have sort of nailed a really difficult concept that we, most people won't even say we study it until we get into the, um, uh, until we get into the uh, Renaissance. And it's the concept of foreshortening. Foreshortening is when something is turning away from you, how do you make it, how do you make accurately display something right? That is sort of moving away from you. Imagine uh, someone reaching their hand straight towards you, right? If their arm is reaching out to the side, it's easy to measure the length of their arm. And if you want to represent that on a two-dimensional surface, you can just, you know, like recreate that, you know, you can make it smaller or whatever. But if it's reaching straight towards you, 
then it's only going to be three inches wide or something like that. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Um, and so these artists here and the fade into background is the other arm of um, the servant sort of fades subtly into the background right here. Um, sort of masterly sculpting techniques um, suggesting that there were, you know, really, really a talented sculptors here. And there were. Um, there were talented sculptors here because this is 410 BCE, which means that this is after uh, the 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 um, Parthenon. And when we look at the Parthenon, the Parthenon is covered with sculpture. And in fact, um, Phidias, who is the artistic designer for um, the Parthenon, he would spare no expense in hiring the greatest sculptors from all across um, Greece to come to Athens and sculpt. So this may be the product of that. So it's a really, really cool sculpture that tells us so many things about the role of women, the culture of Athens at the time, the way the war of the Peloponnesian War may have been going, um, and, and so many other sort of interesting aspects about the Athenians. Definitely an example of something that seems to be putting the mirror up to the Athenians at this particular moment in time and reflecting exactly what life was like. And boy, have we come a long way, you know, from these geometric pots that look more like something that would have come out of the ancient Near East, right? To this masterful, beautiful material that is used in the masterful sculpting and, and things like that. It's really phenomenal stuff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up there because it's kind of a long lecture today. I, that's most of our sculpture from the archaic to the classical period. Be sure that if you have questions that you make sure you ask them the next time that we meet. Thank you, guys. That was a lot of fun for me. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and that's it.